God has done a great thing in me. Amen. Can y'all say the same thing? I, I believe I know everybody in here tonight, so we don't have to guess at it, okay? God does something great in your life. You ought to be happy about it. Amen? Amen. All right. I struggle to be one of those uh, unemotional pastors, okay? <laughs> I don't know that I'm supposed to divorce my feelings from my walk with Christ. I don't think that's an accurate description of what God wants us to do, okay? You see David who had a heart after, uh, uh, God said a man after his own heart, amen? He called David a man after his own heart, amen? amen. And we got to realize that God doesn't want us to be sad and upset and depressed and walk around stoic like we don't love Jesus. Okay, what does it even mean to love Jesus if if I can't be excited about what God done in my heart and in my life? Amen. Uh, I got news for all the people who think we're going to be statues in heaven. Okay. Uh, now, regardless of what you think about the Book of Revelations, there was something very interesting that John saw in chapter four. Okay, John sees the throne room and sees angels and four beasts standing around the throne of God and 24 elders standing around the throne of God and all of a sudden some cherubim which are not fat, fat little naked angel babies floating around on clouds that's not what cherubim are I love that saying okay and I stole it from a heretic so <laughs> I'm using it for good now okay <clears throat> but those Cherubim fly across the sky up there and it says, holy, holy, holy. And John said, when they did that, all the, the four beasts, the 24 elders, and all the people that were standing in front of the throne of God fell on their face and worshipped the God of heaven who lived forever and ever. And they worshipped the Lamb who sat up on the throne. Are you kidding me? Okay. Do you think you're going to do that like this? Oh, glory to God. Holy is God. I think it's going to be a lot more awesome than that, okay? I think it's going to be a lot more emotional than that, okay? The people that try to divorce emotion from our, our uh, born-again experience forget that God's emotional. They forget that God gets angry. That God loves, that God hates, that God rejoices, that the joy of the Lord. Oh, come on, I'm just saying, there, there's all kinds of emotions that God has that's spelled out in Scripture. And, and then when you get really religious, they say, well, you're not supposed to get that happy. You know, I don't even think there's anything wrong with dancing before the Lord. David did it. Danced with all his might. And his wife said, hey, why are you doing that? That don't look right. He said, I don't care what you think. I'm going to keep doing it. I'll get even more undignified, he said, okay? Yeah. So don't let doctrine or theology rob you from a very fulfilling emotional experience in loving Jesus Christ with everything you got, amen? So it's okay to sing. It's okay to raise your hand. It's okay to get excited about the things of God. I bet you if you like football or some other sport, when they score, you're over there, yeah! If you'd have been in any house where Mike and me were watching the Super Bowl, it was like that. Well, only at the end of the fourth quarter, because before that, I was so mad, I was ready to quit, okay? <laughs> Just tell me. Now, I'm just going to do it short devotion tonight about prayer, but I wanted to throw that in there. It's all right to be excited about the things of God. It's all right to be joyful about the things of God. It's all right to, to love God so much you want to dance. It's all right to love God so much you want to shout. It's okay to say amen. It's okay to raise your hands. It's okay to do all that stuff. Amen. amen. 
uh, the 24 elders, when, uh, whenever the angels get done talking and they, they end up they end up singing that song, they say, Amen. And I have a hard time thinking it's like, Amen, Lord. I have a real sneaking suspicion it's going to be like, Amen, tears running down. So they don't cry in heaven, right? So I'd want to cry, though. I want to cry just thinking about being there. Amen. Can you imagine the new Jerusalem? No more sickness, no more death, no more mourning. Amen? That's what it's going to be like. So I want to talk about prayer tonight. And I have a, I preached a message back in, uh, well, July of last year, 2019. Preached a, bat, uh, a series called This Side Fight My Battles. And we were talking about prayer. And my wife, um, when we were doing... Uh, live streams for a month and a half at the beginning of this year I was sick one of those nights with this whole diabetes thing and I couldn't do the message that night so my wife got on there and did a devotion about prayer okay and I kept her notes and she gave me her notes because there's a lot of good stuff in here and I wanted to just give you a portion of this okay it says prayer isn't a ritual okay you know, it might feel like that sometimes. Amen? we got to get it out of our head that it's a ritual. It isn't something we, we are uh, obligated to do in a sense that if we don't, God's never going to do anything for us. Okay? That's what a ritual is. You, a ritual is, if I don't do this, God's not going to do something for me. Okay? God already did something for you before you were ever even saved. Amen. Okay? He already had your life planned out before you were ever born. Remember that? Jeremiah, he said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you and had ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. Amen? So we got to understand that God does not look at prayer or our communication with him as a ritual. It is a symphony to be orchestrated. It does not have a process. It does not, it doesn't deem we run to an altar to kneel, putting our, putting on our holy face. Or lifting up burnt offerings and sacrifices. We can pray anywhere, anytime, while walking, or even driving. And she made it sure to mention, if you are driving while praying, do not close your eyes. Okay? It's pretty important not to do that while you're driving. Probably shouldn't while you're walking. And you, you, <laughs> and you can pray while you're working. She said, I do it a lot while I'm mowing or doing laundry or lawn work, whatever. What better way to praise him for the beauty of his creation and all that is around you? God delights in any simple words offered to him. He wants to talk to you. That's the number one thing about prayer, okay? We think that somehow we're, and a lot of people, are, Lord, I'm sorry to bother you. You don't have to approach God that way. God's not bothered by your prayer. God's not bothered by you coming to him. He expects it. Amen. Amen. God waits in anticipation of you fulfilling his will to come and talk to him. Amen. Amen. Prayer. He wants you to talk to him. He responds to a two-word cry in the middle of a busy afternoon just as much as he does the same at the first at, at the first waking in the morning. It doesn't have to be long prayers. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, don't go on talking like you're going to get something more. Like all these publicans do, they beat their chest and they think for many words like the Gentiles, they're going to get something from God if they just keep on battling. Amen. God is not interested in your battle, but he definitely is interested in your prayer. Amen? Jesus' prayer, we'll get into it, outside the tomb of his friend Lazarus, went just like this. Lord, I know that you always hear me. But for the sake of those around, what did, what, what did he mean for the sake of those around him? He was praying to show them what they should be doing. Amen? Amen. He was praying. 
that they didn't know that this thing that he was doing wasn't, what did he tell the disciples when they, they couldn't cast that one devil out of that, that one guy? He said, this kind comes out but by what? Prayer. Fasting. Meaning that there are some things that you need wisdom on. There are some things that you need an understanding or a word of understanding on how to go about it. Amen? And to think that God won't answer me is mind-boggling to me. Okay? God answers prayer. God don't... Now, I... I'm going to be real careful. God may not speak down from heaven and say, hey, go and do this. But God will lead you by his word. He'll lead you by other people's confirmation of what you feel like you should be doing. As they call that, let all things be done in the church by the witness of what? Two or three? Correct? Let every word be established by the, come on. I'm just telling you biblical things. This is not some phony baloney stuff I'm talking about. This is what scripture talks about in regards to prayer, in regards to knowing God, knowing we're hearing from God. Amen. Let's talk about this. Prayer is a solemn request for help or an expression of thanks addressed to God. Simply put, it's communicating with God, with and to God. Amen. God has called us all to pray. He taught us to pray. And we're going to read that here in just a minute. He taught us to pray. He told us what to do when we pray. Why would he teach us to do something that he did not want us to practice? What's the point? Why teach you to pray? Why tell you how to do it? Why? Huh? If he didn't have an expectation of you doing it. Amen. Prayer is not something that I I can do if I want to. Prayer is something I need to do as a Christian. It's going to benefit me in my walk with God. Okay. Now, we're not going to walk around like some of these guys on TV and the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. Okay. Because if anybody starts doing that all the time to you, walk, walk away. Okay. Because you don't see the apostles doing that, okay? You don't see the apostles walking around like God told me this about your situation. And God told me that about your situation. God told me this about your situation. That ain't in scripture, okay? That's just not. Now, did God give people specific word for specific situations? Sure he did, but it was not as common as we see it today when everybody's got word from God, right? That's the runaway, okay? I love what Steve Lawson said. He said, if you're going to tell me it thus says the Lord, it better be a chapter and verse. Amen. <laughs> Everything that we say in church, if, if there's a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, any of that stuff, it needs to be verifiably understood to be scriptural. You understand me? It has to be. If it's not, throw it out. It don't mean anything. Amen. Let's talk about just one more thing. I know there was something else in here that I wanted to. Most effective. Prayer is the most effective and underutilized weapon in the church today. When I say most effective but underused, well, pastor people pray all the time. Sure they do. We're forgetting one big part of prayer. God's will in our life. Amen. I mean, let's 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 uh let's turn to Matthew, okay? Before I get lost in a tangent here, I want to go to Matthew chapter, I believe it's chapter 10. in the Sermon on the Mount, Kevin. He preached a whole message. He preached a whole three months on the Sermon on the Mount. I can't remember where this passage is. Goodness gracious. I want to start at verse 5, and I want you to notice the phrasing. Now, I'm reading out the English Standard Version. 
So when I read this, I might have somebody reading the King James read it. I might have somebody with an NIV read the first sentence too, okay? We're going we're gonna to see something here. Verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and in the street and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say unto you, they have received their reward. Mike, what's the King James say? And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Amen. Amen. Now, who got an NIV? Anybody? Anybody got an NIV? No, nobody would in on me. It's all right. I can tell you that the NIV says win also. Very first thing in all of these is when you pray. You see, there's an expectation on Jesus' part that you're not going to not pray, okay? There's never a thought in Jesus' mind that you're not going to pray. Okay. Now, in, the, in Luke, in this same story, they came to him and they said, "Teach us to pray, like John's apostles taught, or John's disciples were taught by John how to pray." Right? And when Jesus starts his discourse in Luke, he says this: "When you pray, when, not if, not if you get around to it, not if you think it's a good idea to, not if you got enough time to." He says, "When you pray." Amen. Now, today, we're like, I just can't pray. I just don't have time to pray. I just don't have time to do this for God. I don't have time to do that for God. I don't have time to do this other thing for God. You know, I was asked by somebody in our church, you know, can you really expect people to show up every night for prayer? Sure, I can. Because people make time for what's important to them. Yeah. People do. They'll make time for what's important to them. Okay? Everything else in life that they want to do, people do it. Now, I ain't expecting anybody to sign up for this because me and Mike just made the commitment for ourselves. And if anybody else wants to make that commitment, they can make that commitment. You can pray at home. You don't even have to show up here. I even said that when I posted it on Facebook. I said, you don't have to be here. If you can't be here, pray where you're at at 6 o'clock every night. Just be praying. Amen? But if anybody does want to come and make a commitment to be here every night, praise the Lord. Because I think we need to start putting more emphasis on spiritual things. We need to put more emphasis on doing the things that Christ told us to do. Not read the word less, read it more. Not pray less, do it more. Not meet together less, but do it more. Right. Amen? Amen. Not, uh, he, he, said when you, he said, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves as is the custom of some, but all the much more as we see the day approach. I think we ought to be doing all the things that Christ told us to do, all the much more. And prayer is definitely something that we need to do all the much more. He said, truly I say unto you, they will have their reward. Verse 6. But when you pray, he said it again. He said it again. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you will reward you excuse me and when you pray do not keep up empty phrases as gentiles do for they think they will be heard for their many words do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him pray then like this and we all know this. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And I want to stop right there because that's where we need to be. Okay? Because so many prayers that we hear prayed right now. You can turn the TV on. You can listen to all these TV preachers. And they're praying Oh, they, oh, it's scripture when I'm praying. Stop telling people I'm not praying God's will. I'm praying. No, you don't know that you're praying God's will, okay? Because here's the thing. Does God heal people? Sure he does. Okay? But God also has a purpose in suffering. God 
know if I have a purpose in challenges and tests and trials so that I can be conformed into the image of Christ. And if you keep trying to play me out of that, I'm going to miss exactly what God's trying to do in me. Stop trying to pray it away. Stop trying to play the storm away and just pray, God, I know you're going to get me through this storm, so teach me what I need to learn in the middle of this storm. Help me to have the faith to walk through the storm, and when I get to the other side, I'll know you're sovereign, that you're in control, that nothing is beyond you, nothing is past your ability. Now, that's not to say that we go we go around praying, Lord, I want sickness, or we, we walk around, Lord, just give me poverty. We don't do that. Nobody's going to do that, okay? What I'm saying is, Jesus told us not to worry about what we were going to eat, not to worry about what we're going to wear, not to worry about what we're going to drink. So what do I pray about? How about you pray for the lost? How about you pray that God's will be done in you? That in the midst of whatever trial you're in, you're changed. That your will would be set aside and that God's will would be done in you. See, I want to go to, I believe it's James chapter 5. I think I'm going to, once we're done with this month of prayer, I think I'm going to go and do a whole teaching on the book of James. James chapter 5, and I believe it's verse 13. <clears throat> no, that ain't what I'm looking for. I'm looking for James chapter 4. That's what I want. James chapter 4. I'm sorry. Now, James 5 is a good one, and it does deal with prayer there. It's called, we will talk about the prayer of faith, amen. It does talk about that, and that's definitely a part of what we need to be talking about, okay? But we can't miss what James talks about in chapter 4 before he ever gets to the prayer of faith, okay? You see, every book of the Bible, every, especially the New Testament letters, they're letters, and it's all relevant. Every part of it's relevant. It's a whole message spoke to people, right? So context matters, and everything before James 5 matters, right? So let's look at something. James chapter 4, starting at verse 1. What causes quarrels? What causes fighting among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, and cannot obtain. So you fight and you quarrel, and you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is at no purpose that the scriptures say he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, God says, I, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself therefore unto God resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to God and he will uh, draw near to you cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double minded be wretched and mournful and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you notice what he says here he says when you ask the King James says when you ask, you ask amiss. Wanted to squander it on your own lusts, your own passions, your own exalting of yourself. You understand? And you can hear that in the prayers of all these TV preachers. Okay? You get it. They're, they're praying. They're praying. Well, I'm praying for you to get wealthy. Well, what they're really doing is they're, they're saying that's what they're praying, but... If you call them and you ask them for $30,000 for a church building, these men that are multi-billionaires won't send you a dime. 
Because they're not there to help people. They're there to get rich. And they're doing exactly what we read about at church this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 6, where they think great gain is godliness. But riches are a snare and full of many troubles. Amen? And he said, many have believed this and wandered from the faith. Wow. Do you see that? So when we pray, there's a right way to pray and a wrong way to pray. That's what it tells me. So how do I pray God's will? How do I pray God's will for my life? The same way Jesus did. Look, there was something. Jesus looked in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was praying. Prayed three times. Said the same thing three times. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Now this is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Right? And even Jesus had to go, you know, this isn't really what I want, but you know what? It's not about what I want. Come on. Now, that's in no way to say that Jesus didn't know that he was going to have to go to the cross. That's in no way saying that Jesus' will was at odds with God's will. Amen? Because Jesus is God. The reality is, is here we're seeing Jesus' flesh go, ah! I don't want to do it. Amen? That's what we're seeing here. Jesus' flesh was freaking out, okay? Freaking out so bad when he was praying, he was praying drops of blood, sweat. Amen? Jesus was not at odds with the Father's will. His, his will was not at odds with the Father's will. It was simply his flesh that was being attacked, persecuted, understanding what he was about to endure, okay? And it wasn't just the death of the cross that he was enduring. He was enduring the wrath of God for all of humanity's sin. Okay? He, he was, he who knew no sin was becoming sin that we might be called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's what was happening. So Jesus gave us examples of how to pray God's will. Look, Lord, I would rather you heal me. But you know what? Even if you don't, your will be done. Amen? I'm telling you, I sat in that waiting room back in May, and I had a choice to make. Do I really believe God is sovereign? God's in control? Because I could I could have just went, God, why'd you do this to me? You know, I'm just, I've been preaching how long? Did, done this, I've done that. I could have done all that crazy stuff. Could have cried out like a lot of these people want. Oh, Lord! But instead, I had been preaching for three months about the sovereignty of God, that God's in control, that God is still God in the good times, and he's still God in the bad times. He's God on the mountain, God in the back. Remember that song? I had a choice to make. Do I believe the word of God, that God is sovereign, that all things will work together for the good of them who are called according to his good purpose, or don't I believe that? So I made that decision. God, I'm going to trust you. And instead of saying, why God, why God, why, I said, Lord, thank you for counting me worthy to go through this. Because in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. Amen? Now here we see uh, another one. If you want to go to James 1, we talked about this a little bit. He said, if any man lacks wisdom, this is James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously without reproach, and it will be given. But let him not, let him ask in faith, not doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded. He is a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. Now, 
Now, I could preach a whole sermon on that, and I have before, okay? But the reality is, what am I having faith in? Now, here's a big question. Because we just talked about there's a right way and a wrong way to pray that he got into in James 4. And then in James 5, he talks about the prayer of faith. And here he's talking about wisdom and asking God for wisdom because God will give to every man generously, correct? But here's the thing. Are you trusting in God or are you trusting in what you're asking? Because there's a big difference. Am I trusting in what I'm asking for? Or am I trusting God for what he's going to do? Because I can't separate. There's my will, Jesus, in the garden. And there's God's will. Amen. Now God knows what's best for me, correct? God knows what's good for me and what's not. And what we fail to see is all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes and amen. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean I can pray, God, move this thing out of my way. If God wants it there, guess what? It's going to be there. And once you pray in faith and you go, God, I want this out of here, and God doesn't move it, and maybe at that point you can go, okay, God, not my will, but your will. Amen? Because at some point, at some, here's, the, here's the fallacy that we run into in the understanding of human will. Okay? And I want to talk to you about this just for a second, and then we're going to pray. The fallacy that we have in, in, in the understanding of human will is this. God is infinite, all-powerful, sovereign, correct? We are finite, not in control of anything, right? Dirt, made of live dirt, that's what we are. We're just walking clay that can talk. And somehow people think their will can outride or override God's will. God is infinite. God is all powerful. Are you all powerful? You want me to show you you're not? Watch this. Somebody speak a planet into existence right now. You're not all powerful. God is. Amen. And the reality that we need to come to in Christianity is that we're not in control. God's in control. How many of you have spent your Christian life, sometimes you feel like, man, I'm right in the will of God, and then a lot of other times you go, I don't know what God's doing right now. <laughs> Amen? And you feel completely out of control. Good! Good! Embrace that. You're not in control anyway. There's going to be a day and an hour that God calls each one of us home. The Bible says he's appointed unto every man once to die. So if it's appointed, that means the day I'm supposed to go home to be with Jesus, there ain't going to be a prayer, there ain't going to be a tongue, there ain't going to be a miracle going to stop me from going home. Period. You understand that? If we're if there's an appointment for everyone to go home, that tells you right there that you're not in control. Because none of us would go, yeah, I don't want to do that. What if you found out tomorrow's the day that God decided to take you home? Most people would be going, oh man, oh man, I'm not ready for this. Right? Most of us would be all flesh would be doing the same thing Jesus did. Sweating great drops of blood, we'd be up all night. Right? Because the reality is, we say we trust God. But do we really? And that's where prayer comes in. Amen. So I want to close. We're going to pray. And you can stop the recording. 
I'll be with you in Cody in the morning. That's awesome. Okay? Oh, okay. You can stop the recording. We're going to pray. The reality of prayer is this. That we're not seeking to move God's hand. We're seeking to move right into God's will. Amen? Because God will move his hand. And I'm not telling you, hey, don't pray for your sick loved ones. I'm not telling you that. Pray for your sick loved ones. You don't know that that ain't God's will either. Okay? You don't. You, how many of you here know the mind of God on everything? Exactly. So you don't pray going, Lord, don't help them. That's not the right kind of prayer either, right? When somebody's sick, we pray for healing. When somebody's not feeling well, we're going to pray for healing. When somebody is, is in a bad situation, we're going to pray that God clears it up. Amen? But even when we pray that, we have to pray with the understanding that God may have another purpose. Amen? So we're going to pray in faith. And then we're going to trust the sovereign God to do what he wants to do. Amen. So prayer isn't only bringing my petition to God so God can do something for me. But prayer is me understanding the will of God and being moved into it. Amen. So we're going to stand and pray. And we're going to take a few minutes here. We're going to take a few minutes here to pray. I don't want to be in a hurry. I don't want to act like, oh, we got to pray in five minutes and everybody's got to leave. But I'm praying for I'm praying for some specific things over the next 30 days. I'm praying that God wakes up his people to really live their life for him. According to his word, according to the leading and guiding of the spirit, living the Christian life. We become apathetic. We become uncommitted. And I'm praying that God breeds commitment. And I'm starting here at Agape Fellowship Church with just our people. Amen? And, and then the other churches in Coffeyville. And then at the whole area. Amen? And then I'm praying for the lost people of this town. That they would see the light of what God's doing in us. They would come to faith in Christ because of the word of God. And our testimony of what God's done in us. Amen? Because you read Revelation, he said, These are they that overcame what? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of testimony. Amen? It's all about Jesus. And if if we could start the book of James, James says, starts out saying, James, servant, slave unto God. And many of us need to get that in our heart, that I'm a servant, that I'm a slave, that I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price, so I need to live like I'm bought with a price. Amen. So that's what I'm praying for. You can pray whatever you want. You can come up to the altars and pray. You can come. You can pray right where you're at. But we're going to take probably five minutes, ten minutes. If you don't want to stay, if you want to go home, you're more than welcome to leave. But we're going to pray in closing. Amen. Amen. Father God, I just thank you. Lord, I praise you that even... Even on nights like tonight, God, where we're not exegeting scripture and we're not diving into the deep depths of some great spiritual things, God, that we can understand the simple message of what it is to pray, what it is to seek you, what it is to cry out to you with all of our heart as believers Lord, your, your disciples in the early church, they prayed without ceasing. They prayed. They prayed all the time, God. They sought you because they knew that you had made a way by Jesus Christ for us to come boldly before the throne of grace. Lord, that you did not put your hand out and stop us at the door and say, oh, that's just close enough. But that you have embraced us through Christ, that you have called us your own, that you have called us from darkness 
into your glorious light, not to lead us with, with uh, 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 and leave us where we are, but to continually have us come before you and pray and seek your face, seek your will, seek your purpose in everything that we're doing, God. So this morning, Lord, or this evening, Lord, as we pray, Lord, we ask that you would help us to have a heart of revival, a heart of, that's refreshed by the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the understanding and the expectation that Christ has for his church, for his body, to be people of prayer. Lord, you, saw, you showed us in the Word in Acts that, that these, the men that were spoken to on the day of Pentecost, that they gave their self to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread and to fellowship and to the prayers. They devoted themselves to prayer, God. That's what I'm praying for, God. Starting with me, starting with this church, starting with the people in this room, God, build a devotion to prayer in our hearts, God. Help us see the intrinsic value of coming before the throne of God. Help us see the intrinsic value of seeking you, of crying out to you, of bringing our prayers and petitions and requests and making them known to you, God. Help us to understand that prayer is not something that's optional in the life of a believer, but it is something that is of utmost importance. That we need it, God. That it is a, a fundamental step, a fundamental help, a fundamental uh, a part of being a Christian because you use our prayer life. You use these prayers to, to not only change us and mold us and shape us into the image of Christ, but to, but to, to, to show your love towards other people and, and having your church be burdened with the cares and the the, the hurts and the pains of other people and bringing them before you, God. Lord, you call our prayers in the book of Revelation a sweet-smelling savor, an incense that goes up before your throne in heaven, God. So tonight, God, we, we don't do this lightly, God. We don't do it with any kind of heart of look at me or Watch me or listen to me, God. We do it with a heart that says, Lord, we need you. And we cry out to you like Jesus' disciples from the first century. And we say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Lord, teach us that we need to honor and glorify you in our prayer life. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, we don't want our will. We don't want our kingdom. We don't, we're not trying to establish our own, our, our own kingdom, God, but we are here to establish your kingdom, God. And we're asking that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, lead us not into temptation, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. We thank you for cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we pray that where we falter and where we fail, Lord, that you would pick us up. That you would carry us. That you would empower us even in our weakness to be strong, to be witnesses for you. God, tonight, let Agape Fellowship Church's members understand. Let, Lord, I pray that you would just burden their heart. Let the Holy Spirit burden their heart with a desire, a longing to pray, a longing to come boldly before the throne of grace, a longing to get in their prayer closet and to seek their Father who is in heaven. And the Father who is in heaven who sees what's done in secret, Lord, you will reward us. Not with, not with things and stuff, but you will reward us with the understanding, the wisdom, the direction, the guidance, the empowering and the emboldening of the Holy Spirit to live our life for Christ. That we would truly be dead to ourselves and alive in Jesus Christ. 
that we would truly love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. Lord, that we would have no reservations, not holding any, that anything back, God. That's what we desire. That's what we seek, God, is to be that intimate with you, God, that there's nothing left of me. That I would decrease and that Christ would increase. Lord, not that we're receiving any more of Jesus than we already have, but that we are dying daily to this flesh, to this life, to this world, and that Jesus Christ is burning more brightly, more luminous than ever before in our life because we are not in control. Lord, I just ask that you would burden our church with this, with hearts of prayer, that would, that would pray the word of God, that would know the word of God, and to pray the will of God through the word of God. Lord, I pray that in doing all this in us, Lord, that it would spill out to other churches, that your spirit would move on other pastors' hearts, that your spirit would move on other church members' hearts from other churches, that they would be burdened with this need to pray, this need to seek you, God. Because this generation is seeking everything but Christ. They're seeking everything the world has to offer. They're seeking uh, the, the, the gift and not the giver, God. Help us to seek the giver. There's only one way to heaven, and it's Jesus. Help us, Lord, to understand that that's the way we ought to run. That's the way we ought to, to seek. That's the way we ought to knock. Through Christ, through the gospel, through the understanding of what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We ask, Lord, that you would that you would give us wisdom in reaching the reaching out to the lost that are around us, God. That as we preach and proclaim the gospel, Lord, that your effectual work would be working in the hearts and minds of men and women all in this town, God. That you would be that you would be reaping and sowing in every heart that you have called, God, that you would bring them back to the life, God. That you would bring them back to Christ. That faith would be birthed in their heart, Lord. That they would come to knowledge and the understanding of who Jesus is. Who you are, God, and who they are. That they would see their great need for you. And that in that, God, you would redeem, that you would save, that you would regenerate those who you're calling, God. Help us. Help us, God, to live our lives for you. Help us to be salt and light. Lord, help us to be effective witnesses for you. Lord, my heart's desire is not that Kevin O'Connor would ever be seen. My heart's desire is not that Kevin O'Connor would ever even be remembered, God. But that Jesus Christ would be lifted up. That Jesus Christ would be seen in me. That, that the message of the gospel would be heard on my lips. That my life would reflect Jesus Christ in every aspect. Lord, the greatest epitaph that could be on my gravestone would be here was a man who loved Jesus, who believed the gospel, shared it with others. Lord, I pray that that's my legacy, that it wouldn't even be me, but that it would be Christ in me, that it would be the gospel at work in my life. The redemption of Christ at work in my life that anybody see. Lord, I pray that for everybody in this room, for everybody that is in every church in this city, God, that you would start this new 
fire, God, of old understanding, Lord, that we are to pray at all times, that the church of Christ is supposed to pray without ceasing, that this is an expectation, this is an act, absolute necessity for those who believe to follow you. It's part of being a disciple. Help us to see that. Help us to believe that. Help us to live that and do that. And share that heart, that, that spirit of prayer, God. Help us as we pray. We know that your spirit, even when we don't know what to pray, makes intercession and prays for us. So, Lord, as we close tonight, these are our prayers. This is our heart's desire. And God, we ask that you would have your will, have your way in our lives, in our hearts, and in our prayers. We ask this in Jesus' name.